Hello. I guess we're we're live. Uh, never ceases to to surprise me. Uh, thank you everybody for joining, and I hope everybody is having a wonderful week, a wonderful Friday, and most importantly, what we're talking about today, a wonderful plastic free July. Um, so I'm I'm really excited to invite some of my colleagues as well as uh, our partner in Plain Products to to this panel today and, and I hope that we can have a very spirited discussion and, and really discuss what Plastic Free July means to us, to our companies and, and then um, have, like I said, a, a spirited conversation. So I'll, um, I'll start just by way of introduction. My name is Tony Rossi. I am the VP of Business Development for Loop Globally. I've been with Loop as long as it has been an idea incubating inside our, our CEO, Tom Zaki's mind, uh, which is about three years now. And then for the years before that, I, I held a similar role on the TerraCycle side. So I've been working in this space for, for almost a decade now. And um, when it comes to Plastic Free July, I think it's a wonderful movement, you know, one where millions of people in 150 plus countries around the world can actively participate in trying to stem the use of single use plastics. And I think that is a really exciting initiative. And personally, as, as I reflect upon kind of my time working in recycling, working in, in waste management and TerraCycle and Loop, um, a common question that that or comment that we get a lot is, "I'm one person. How can I make a difference?" And and to look at the the popularity of Plastic Free July and how it's grown, I think now is is such a wonderful time in this movement, and people now more than ever are, are truly making a global distance. So again. Thank you so much for, for joining today. And, and I'm going to, to pass it over to my colleagues to introduce themselves uh, and, and what they do. Oh, okay, I'm next. Hi, <laughs> I'm Lindsay McCoy. I am the co-founder of Plain Products, along with my sister, Allison Webster. My background is actually in nonprofit management. So I'm, I'm a little bit different. Um, we founded Plain Products three years ago to try and provide a, a different way of solving the plastic problem. And for, for me, Plastic Free July is a great opportunity for um, people to just take a step back and look at how much single-use plastic they're using. I think that plastic has become so ubiquitous in our life that it's easy to just not notice how much we use. And I think that it is a real opportunity to try and you know, change one aspect, maybe stop using single use water bottles or straws. And then, you know, that kind of helps you notice how many you were using and that you actually don't need. And then maybe that leads to larger change. So that's the hope. And we're excited to be a part of this today. Thanks for having us, Loop. And we're excited to be partners with Loop. Hmm. Um, my name is uh, Sue Kaufman. And I I am the uh, public relations lead for TerraCycle. I handle all of the uh, execution and strategy behind the media campaigns uh, surrounding the uh, several numerous recycling initiatives that TerraCycle offers. Um, my background, I've been working in public relations for nearly 20 years, and I've uh, primarily been in the uh, consumer space, and I've dealt with pretty much every industry and uh, type of client under the sun, and uh, I've been with TerraCycle now for about three years. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Matuszewski. Uh, I am the executive director for the TerraCycle Global Foundation. Um, I've had the honor and privilege to be working uh, in the TerraCycle community for about four years now, uh, largely focused on Loop before getting involved with the TerraCycle Global Foundation. But um, 
What we do on the foundation front uh, is really uh, engage in uh, recycling solutions, bringing the TerraCycle methods to principally emerging markets um, that are really uh, choking uh, in, in plastic in, in many ways and um, really bringing you know, our expertise to those regions, uh, specifically in Thailand, India, uh, we're uh, very much looking at other markets as well. So uh, it's an honor and privilege to be here today. Um, and yeah, looking forward to the rest of the, the meeting today. Great. So thank you so much, Brian, um, Stu and, and Lindsay for participating. We have a really great panel here and let's, let's dive right into it. And I'll, I'll go to, to Lindsay first. And, and this is a question for all the panelists. Was there a specific moment or, or memory that impacted your choice to choose a career fighting single-use plastics? Um, actually, there was. I lived in the Bahamas for 10 years. My husband's from the Bahamas, and I ended up doing environmental education work there. And you know, in countries that don't have the same ability that we have in the U.S. to sort of always disappear. Um, single use plastic is a much more apparent problem. You see it on the beaches, in the water, on, on the side of the road. And so that that visual aspect for me of plastic literally piling up made it hard for me to ignore it anymore. And that's when I had that moment of like, oh my gosh, I throw this away and it's there forever. And, you know, for me, that was something once I, I saw it, I couldn't unsee it. So I started making those choices of, you know, refusing straws, carrying around my water bottle, carrying around my bags. And one place I couldn't find a solution was the shower. And that's what led us to start Plain Products, was just trying to solve our own problem of having a little less plastic in our lives. Well, um, my moment was uh, I've worked in PR for several years and as I said, numerous industries. And uh, while I love the act of doing PR, what I often thought was that what I was doing was not going to change the world in any meaningful way other than uh, impacting the bottom line of the company that I was representing. And while there's nothing wrong with that, um, I wanted more. Um, it was at that point that I found TerraCycle. I, uh, just like everybody else, I was kind of rolling through my career. I found a job at for TerraCycle and I applied. And after one interview and uh, hearing about the mission and what they do and uh, everything that they're involved in and, and how passionate everybody was about, uh, you know, eliminating the idea of waste, that I knew that I found my next home. And it was exactly what I was looking for. And um, yeah, fortunately, they hired me and uh, the rest was history. So uh, on my front, uh, it was actually a very specific moment. Uh, I was a senior in college. You know, it was a pretty, you know, uh, lazy time of the year. And, and a friend just happened to recommend uh, a book to me. Uh, it was a book by William McDonough, Cradle to Cradle. Uh, I'm sure some of you have um, read him as well. And I, I was just blown away by the vision that he expressed in this book of a circular economy, um, you know, designing out waste from the very beginning, really challenging the status quo. And having been quite interested in just general economic development for, for a number of years before that, um, I, I just thought circular economy thinking was just the perfect frame to advance economic development moving forward. And uh, from that moment on, you know, I, I knew I wanted to you know, stick around a couple more years in school to, you know, do a master's in environmental policy to explore this topic more. And, um, and yeah, I've been hooked ever since. And, you know, when I met Tom uh, a few years ago, uh, and the idea of loop was just bubbling up in his head, uh, that for me was the beginning of my dream job. And that job and journey has, you know, gone to some amazing places these last few years. And, and yeah, really excited to you know, be taking that journey now to emerging markets with the TerraCycle Global Foundation. 
Amazing. And I guess for, for me, my experience actually mimics Lindsay's a little bit, where I was abroad as well. I was working at a big law firm in, in Austria, in Europe, and I, wa- I moved into to a new apartment and, and I was taking down my, my waste and my recycling to, to our kind of recycling center at that apartment. And an 80 year old um, Austrian woman was just really screaming and giving it to me in German, which I do not speak German at all. So I was, I was dumbfounded. But what was interesting was I was putting all of my recycling in one bin. I were, I'm, I'm Canadian. I grew up in Toronto. I live here in the U.S. now. We're accustomed to mixed recycling. If it's plastic, if it's glass, if it's metal, paper, we put it in one bin. And in Austria, we were sorting it into eight. And, and that really piqued my interest. I wanted to know why. Um, so that was, that was the moment for me where I really started to pay attention more. Um, and then when I eventually, you know, six years later, ended up moving back to North America, I, I said, you know, how do I marry this curiosity, this passion for the environment with my desire to, to really have a professional career? Um, and lo and behold, it was political, and, and the rest is kind of history. So that was, that was my personal moment. So if we, we continue to, to move along here, um, I think it would be great to get everybody's um, perspective on the, the plastic crisis as it is today. And, and maybe, you know, we can start with Sue. Sue, can you give your background in, on TerraCycle, what we do, what our history was, um, you know, where, where we have global offices and, and maybe the different lines of businesses that we have as well. Sure. Um, so TerraCycle was founded uh, by Tom and Tom Zaki, our C- CEO, in uh, 2001 while he was a freshman at uh, Princeton. Uh, the original business model was rather unique. Uh, it was, uh, we were creating organic fertilizer and we were doing it from the poop of worms. And we were feeding it uh, the we were feeding the worms the uh, food waste from the cafeteria at Princeton, and uh, so and the result was or truly fantastic nitrogen rich organic fertilizer that was just amazing, and uh, so and so we did that for a while. But currently, what we did we pivoted from that, and that's the that's the the unique thing about TerraCycle. We're forever pivoting. And uh, now what we do is um, we specialize in finding recycling solutions for some of the world's toughest uh, garbage problems, uh, proving that everything is technically recyclable. So um, basically, in short, we pick up where the municipal recycling facilities stop. And so we solve for all of the waste problems that they can't handle. So things that, uh, that like snack wrappers or you use chewing gum or coffee capsules, cigarette butts, uh, and nearly a hundred other waste streams that you know municipal recycling facilities can't recycle. So we're not competing; we're just fixing. And uh, we do this through uh, four different uh, lines of business. So uh, the first one is our free recycling program, and this is a brand-sponsored recycling programs that are completely free to the consumer. Um, all the consumer needs to do is visit the TerraCycle website, uh, terracycle.com, and uh, sign up for any of the programs uh, that are of interest to them. Start uh, collecting the specified waste stream, send it into us with a free recycling, um, a, free, a free shipping label rather, and uh, then we will process it and make sure that it's diverted from landfill and uh, completely uh, recycled. Uh, the second line of business is our zero waste box program. Uh, this allows us to um, offer a recycling solution for nearly every type of waste, not just specific waste that are brand sponsored. 
So this is, so it could be anything. It could be entire waste streams like uh, beauty products or uh, any kind of brand of coffee capsule or any kind of packaging uh, waste. Or we have everything boxes that you can put everything in. And what happens is you, the individual consumer purchases the box. And uh, that, while the price point might be a little high, that pays for the cost of the recycling. And it might take you six months to fill it up. And um, so you choose the box that suits your needs. We have everything from a pouch to a pallet. And uh, when it's full, you ship it back to TerraCycle, we process it. <clears throat> And then the third unit is our TerraCycle Regulated Waste uh, Program, where this is designed more for B2B in that it's re if we recycle the waste that is regulated by the federal government. And so that it could, if that would be hazardous if you diverted it to the landfill. So we're talking about uh, the mercury and fluorescent bulbs and that type of thing. Um, and then there's Loop, uh, the, our host for today. Uh, this is a global circular, you're going to hear more about this later, but this is a global circular shopping platform that's designed to eliminate the idea of waste by uh, transforming the products and packaging for everyday items from single use to durable, multi use features. And uh, then uh, so we're currently operating in uh, over 20 countries and uh, we're just working every day to uh, fulfill our mission of eliminating the idea of waste. Thanks, Sue. Um, yeah, it's it's fun to sit here. Uh, where, when I joined, we definitely didn't have the breadth that we have today at TerraCycle. So thank you for walking through that. Brian, maybe you can quickly kind of add on and maybe pick up where, where Sue left off because the foundation, well, part of it, it's very unique um, and, and tackles a different opportunity. So over to you. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. So the TerraCycle Foundation is, is one of TerraCycle's newest ventures. Uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's a nonprofit uh, entity uh, that is presently operating in Thailand. Uh, we had very exciting plans on entering India. And similar to how TerraCycle is involved in creating solutions around hard recycle waste. We do just that in emerging markets. Uh, so in Thailand specifically, uh, we're focused on engineering uh, collection and really innovative solution systems for river waste, uh, specifically in heavily polluted canals in Bangkok. And in India, uh, we're focused on partnering with local waste pickers uh, purchasing their waste, uh, that waste stream is specifically focused on multi-layer plastic packaging. So these are types of waste that is very difficult for uh, a traditional municipality to recycle, given the fact that the value um, of that material is quite low, which uh, makes it very difficult for there to be a natural ecosystem to recycle that material. And, uh, and yeah, we're very excited to bring TerraCycle's uh, R and D and 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 uh, you know solution expertise for that waste stream. Um, one of the benefits of operating as a nonprofit is we get to secure funding from philanthropy, charitable organizations that help us uh, you know offset uh, the the cost of being able to do this important work, and especially in emerging markets like India and Thailand. You know, these, these are markets that are booming. Um, there, there's a, a quickly growing middle class. And unfortunately today, the existing waste management infrastructure is quite limited. So um, we're really excited as the foundation to you know, be part of the solution to this waste crisis. And, and yeah, that's a, that's a quick overview. Thank you, that's, uh, that's great, Brian. So Lindsay, over to you now, uh, I think, Again, there's a theme here, picking off where picking up where others have left off. Uh, while recycling is is incredibly important and the core of our business, your mission has always been to to really remove single use plastics. So, can you tell us, you know, how how you've gone about that, and and how did you start um, playing products? Yeah, I mean. I'm so grateful that TerraCycle exists because you know the reality is plastic are not going away, you know, anytime soon. 
and it is important to recycle them whenever and however we can. But that being said, you know, even when plastic is recycled, unfortunately, that's only once or twice before it ends up in a landfill anyway. So we were excited to try and introduce this new model, you know, which, which Loop is also doing, of reusable containers and trying to shift that whole conversation from single use to, you know, involving people um, to, to take responsibility for their packaging, for the producers and the consumers to play a part. And using materials that could be recycled infinitely, which is how we ended up in aluminum bottles. So for us, much like Loop, we ship out the bottle, it comes with a pump. You know, when, when your product is running low, we ship you just a refill bottle, you switch the pump over, and we take that bottle back and we wash and refill and reuse it. So, you know, looking again at consumerism from a whole new angle of you don't get something, use it and throw it away. You actually participate in, in that reuse model. And we have, as I'm sure you guys have, people are so excited to be able to do something with their packaging. Um, you know, we're not able as a small company to track bottles and offer incentives. And we still get 75 to 80% back just because people are, are excited to participate, are excited to lower their footprint and, and to have a convenient means of doing so. Amazing. Thank you, Lindsay. And, you know, for us, we're, we're similar. Right. I think with Loop, we are we are a platform for reusability, you know, and we wanted to actively partner with companies like yours um, and, and bring as many products as possible to the consumer um, and, and give the consumer the option to live their life in reusability. And I think that's that's really part of our mission and what we're striving for. Um, every day. I think as, as we sit here and reflect on kind of the growth of Loop, we're you know, 14 months live in, in the United States and France. Uh, we, we just launched actually in the UK on Wednesday of this week. And, and when I think about our company and, and our mission, what's core to it is, is the consumer, right? Why are we doing this now? And, and why is it, you know, early on, why is it successful? And I think it's because the consumer now more than ever wants to do the right thing. Innately in our core, we, we want to do what's best for the environment and, and reuse is an easy concept to grasp, right? Uh, when it's empty, I send it back and around and around we go. And I think that innate desire from the consumer has really propelled the platform. That said, if we would have launched Loop five, six years ago, I, I don't know if we would have had the same success early on. Uh, and that's because, you know, I don't know if the consumer was ready yet. You know, there was a clear turning point for me as, as I reflect, and this is my personal opinion, you know, three, four years ago when David Attenborough came out with, you know, Blue Planet uh, and, and really focused on the problems of pollution in the oceans the consumer woke up in such a big way and started to demand from from everybody from TerraCycle from you know all of our partners on the retailer and brand side that we need to do better so i think that's what's changed today and as we reflect on plastic free july like it's such an amazing point in time and i think we're on the precipice of of real change so i'm going to to, to keep picking it up here um, for everybody. And maybe we'll, we'll start with Lindsay this time and then we'll go to, to Brian and then end with Sue. What are some of the barriers that you have to your model today? You know, I think for us, it's just that awareness. Um, you know, people that have already heard about the plastic crisis and are thinking about it are so excited to participate. And, and I think Loop has had the same experience, but helping people have that awareness and, and to see and think about their consumer purchases in a different way is, is really hard to break through that barrier. Um, and so, you know, Plastic Free July is a great opportunity to, to raise that. And I think honestly, just people talking to their friends and family about the choices that they're making and why they're making it is what we need. You know, trusted individuals helping spread the word because 
I do think when people are, are armed with information, they make better choices. Nobody wants to be doing the wrong thing. Nobody wants to be damaging the planet, but you have to have that information and that insight before you can make those choices. Yeah, I, from, from my perspective, you know, working in these emerging markets re regions, um, you know, I, I definitely feel one of the big challenges is just, there's just similar to what Lindsay was saying, just a lack of awareness of the consequences of single use packaging. And just there, there, there's this very common mindset that, you know, it's, it's okay to just dump this in, in a waterway and, you know, uh, that there's no consequence to that. And that's, you know, one of the, the things that we're doing as a foundation is we're really investing heavily in not just figuring out how to effectively collect the waste and figure out a solution for it, but engaging the community with uh, education, uh, engaging all the key stakeholders, other NGOs operating in these places to make sure that waste prevention uh, is in mind and, and, and just educating the communities that we're operating in on, you know, why it's important to uh, properly dispose um, that type of packaging and, and encourage them to, to use things like reusable, you know, water bottles and, and so forth. So I would say education is, is, is a key aspect. Mm. At ter with TerraCycle, our key barrier is uh, participation. You know, oftentimes, you know, you hear in in the media or you hear from your friends or you hear on Facebook or LinkedIn or, or all any kind of outlet that you get your information from uh, how pervasive the problem of waste is. You hear about the garbage patches and 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 how and how the world is just turning into a giant uh, landfill and, and there's garbage everywhere and it's 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 just awful situation. So it feels rather insurmountable. It feels like you're there's no solution for it that it's just gotten so bad that there's nothing you can do. So with TerraCycle, we try to break it down. We try to simplify it and we try to identify ways that the individual can make a change. And like, as I uh, laid out earlier, you know, with the various uh, lines of businesses that we have, all of them are very turnkey. They're all very simple. They're all very straightforward. Um, you know, sign up for the free recycling program and there's no cost in it for you. All we need you to do is not throw it away save it in a box, sign up for the program and send it to us. And you're done. That's it. We handle all the rest. And now you've diverted the waste. So I, I saw a statistic that there's a, a average person creates 185 pounds of waste in a, in a year. And so if you just recycled the, the plastic packaging from your snack wrappers or from your chip bags, or you didn't throw away your coffee pods and you just saved them and sent them to TerraCycle to be recycled through one of our programs. Just think of all the waste that you could have diverted from the landfill. It's just that easy. It doesn't, you don't have to be some huge corporation to fix this problem. It can come just from what are you going to do with your coffee pod after you've made your coffee in the morning? It's that simple, but trying to, to to get people to understand that and to not feel overwhelmed by the problem is basically my job. That's what I do. I do in the media. I tell them every day in pretty much every media outlet that it can just be simple. It doesn't need to be so hard. Don't overthink this. Let us do the work for you, but just participate in the program and we're done. So that's that's kind of where we are from TerraCycle perspective. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Sue. I think for for us, uh, I loop some of the the kind of the the barriers that we see to our model are, I think, scale and just speed. You know, in in the in the comments that that we have on on the live chat, you know, there's Lisa's asking when are you coming to Washington. Um, I wish we could have been in Washington a year ago when we launched. So I think you know we are we're still very new. And we 
we want to to scale and bring this solution to as many people as quickly as we can but it's it's not the easiest thing especially when we are working with a lot of different companies ranging from the very small to the very large and for a lot of them uh we're asking them to change the way that they do business you know we're asking them to move away from a hundred years of, of efficiency and development and 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 you know, change course. And and that's not an easy thing to do. But as as again, as I reflect on, on where we started and where we are today, you know, Loop Loop's been live for 14 months. And you know, we've we've added many more brands, we've improved uh, our offering, we um, are are trying to to make make durability as easy and convenient as disposability. I think that is, that's our biggest barrier today, right? Where convenience in, in the single use space um, is very attractive. You know, as, as somebody who, when, when the world isn't, you know, uh, amidst a pandemic, I, I spend 70 to 75% of my time on the road. And it's really convenient for me to walk into an airport and grab a snack with with you know single use plastic packaging and um, you know we have to make durability that easy as well and I think when we do we're going to attract not only all of us who are on this call and, and are clearly motivated by the environment and want to do the right thing but we're going to attract our, our friends our family our networks businesses people who maybe don't have the same passion that we have and we're going to kind of force them into doing the right environmental thing and i think when we can do that we're really going to to have um a scalable solution that is going to make everything easier for everyone which i'm, I'm pretty excited about so um moving along here and and this is again a question for everybody let's let's start with with Lindsay and then we'll go to Sue and then to Brian. Um, I guess the, the monkey in the room here is, you know, COVID. COVID, COVID has really um, been a curveball here in 2020. So, you know, how, is, how has our business been impacted by COVID and, you know, has it created more of a demand for, for our products? Um. For us, you know, I think that the the green system that we put in place had already taken into account sanitization for viruses, germs, all of that, you know, the high heat and sanitation that we use. So we felt like we were well positioned, you know, unfortunately, when COVID started, there was a lot of fear and concern and, and people just didn't know what was safe, what was unsafe we really pride ourselves on transparency and people wrote it and said, you know, what are you doing? How are you using this bottles? Is it safe? And, and, you know, we were able to say, yeah, look, you know, there, there were germs and viruses before COVID. We wanted to make sure that we were taking care of those. You know, our system also takes care of these. Um, and so we had built a real system of trust with our customers. And so very luckily we were not negatively impacted. In fact, we have been going up through the pandemic. I mean, I think being able to deliver, online was a huge bonus. Um, I will also say that recently there was a letter signed by 120 health experts that came out talking about the safety of reuse. Um, and, you know, we're trying to share that as much as possible. I know Tom has been a huge advocate of it as well. And just, you know, explaining to people that sanitation is the important thing and it's much easier and safer to clean, you know, aluminum, stainless steel, the high heat than it is to clean plastic. So really, you know, those those reusable items are actually better and safer for you in the long run. Yeah, maybe Sue. Before we before we turn it over to you, I just want to chime in because Lindsay, I think our businesses are are so they're aligned, and obviously we're partners. Um, yeah, I think COVID has really shone a light and and emphasized the model that we've been running already, and that is. Reusability can be safe, especially when it's done in a professional environment. Um, and then with the boom of e-commerce, we were well positioned um, to, to fill that need that consumers have. But something that you said that was, is really important to me and something that's overlooked sometimes is that 
You mentioned aluminum and cleaning it at high heat, right? In order to be safe, we have to go through those cleaning protocols. Um, and we, we need to tap into materials that enable reusability, right? And that is using alloys, it is using glass. In some instances, it is using plastic. Um, but the key is it's not single use, it's durable and it allows us to meet the very stringent safety requirements that the government and, and brands have um, so that we, we can reuse these packages. So it was such an important point. Um, so thank you for calling that out. Over to you now, Sue. <laughs> um, TerraCycle at its core is considered a waste management company. And uh, so in our state, we were considered an essential business. So we were able to maintain um, our operations and continue uh, working and processing the waste that we were receiving. And, and uh, so we were fortunate enough not to be um, sustain too much uh, impact from COVID. Um, so, but there were locations, we have uh, several uh, public drop-off locations that we operate to, again, make it as simple as possible for people to uh, recycle their waste and divert it from the landfill. And unfortunately, these were forced to temporarily close. But as, as the states are reopening and as companies are reopening and as people are starting to emerge, um, our recycling uh, processes and programs are coming back online very quickly and uh, we're uh, coming back strong. Yeah, so from what I've been observing uh, is, you know, obviously this flood of consumers using disposable tableware and, you know, ordering everything disposable uh, is, is certainly flooding into the environment. And we're also seeing this in places like India and Thailand. And I mean, no joke, every day I, I wake up uh, to emails from my team in Thailand with just the latest photos of these canals in Bangkok. And it is absolutely choking in plastic. And it's something that, you know, I, I always knew this was a challenge, but seeing it, you know, that intimately on a daily basis is quite sobering and just highlights how serious this problem is. And then we look at India where we're partnering with local waste pickers. Um, a lot of their operations have been put on pause due to COVID, um, which is you know, basically resulting in this material winding up in the natural ecosystem, both on land and on water. So uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's not a good situation. Uh, it, it, COVID has definitely made the crisis worse. And that crisis is, you know, further compounded by the fact that, you know, oil prices have been plummeting, which basically makes the demand for recycled material even less today. So we really do have this 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 perfect storm for an environmental crisis uh, brewing, and you know, uh, you know, hopefully soon uh, we'll, we'll be able to address these 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 issues more more directly. Got it. Thank you, guys. Um, so moving on, I'm, I'm going to try and pick up the pace just a little bit because we have a lot of wonderful questions coming in. And, and please keep sending them and we'll make sure that we have time at the end um, to address those. Um, but first, more of us uh, floating heads here. So let's, let's kind of pivot into how our companies are, are fighting, you know, the plastics um, crisis. So maybe, again, we'll start with Lindsay, we'll go to Sue and then Brian. What do you think a company's responsibility is right now to respond to climate change um, and, and the problems that exist in, in plastic waste? I, I mean, I, I think climate change is the crisis of our generation for me. Um, you know, it, it, it's everybody's responsibility, honestly in my opinion, to, to respond to it and to take what action that we can. Um, you know, plastics are made from fossil fuels and that is a huge part of climate change. And, you know, every step that we can take away from that and towards generating less waste and using less fossil fuels, I think is a good one for everyone. And, mm -hmm. you know, I would love to see the playing field leveled. You know, it's impossible for companies 
like ours who are taking responsibility for our packaging and, and using more expensive packaging to compete with people that are using cheap plastic and cheap ingredients. Um, so action taken to reduce fossil fuel subsidies, um, I think will just, just well, like I said, level the playing field and have us all competing on, on the same terms. Great, Sue, over to you. Well, um, TerraCycle's role um, in, in a lot of this is our objective is to make high recycling rates a reality. Um, we provide solutions where solutions don't exist. Um, you know, at our core, we're just, as I mentioned, a waste management company, and we're trying to fill the gaps where the traditional solutions fall short. So, and, you know, just to put it succinctly, we don't compete. Uh, we complete. So we pick up, we provide a solution to the large uh, packaging companies uh, for uh, their packaging issues that, that the municipal recycling um, companies cannot. So I think that it's, you know, I think just by providing a solution to an existing problem, um, I mean, this isn't going to be solved overnight. This is not something that is is, is has a magic bullet to it. But by providing a, a source where these things can be recycled effectively and diverted from the landfill and thereby, you know, uh, reducing the impact on the environment is um, a really uh, important step right now until a larger solution can be um, put together. Great, Brian, what about you? Yeah, I, I think we are seeing an increasing number of companies taking responsibility, understanding the seriousness of these very important challenges that we're faced with, with climate change, with you know natural resource depletion and so forth. And, and, and yeah, you know, I, I think businesses are also seeing this as, you know, a, a business opportunity given how stark that challenge is, whether that's a business opportunity with respect to viewing this as a risk management initiative. I mean, it's very, we're seeing one by one governments across the globe enact regulations that are, you know, banning things like single use packaging or requiring manufacturers to take accountability for their packaging mm. and investing in that process. And I think, you know, that the companies out there that are seeing that, you know, they're, you know, engaging in partnerships with entities like Loop and TerraCycle and the foundation, because it's not just the right thing to do, but it's just good business sense to do that. And when you look at the fact that, you know, more and more people are engaged and aware of these topics, um, people want to be working for companies that are doing the right thing. And, 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 you know, this is just basic, you know, HR, right? You, you want to have people that are proud to be working at the place where they're spending most of their hours in the day. And I, I just think, you know, the, the trend is looking positive in that respect. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm an innately optimistic person. I'm aware of the, you know, serious challenges out there, but I, I do think uh, we are trending in the right direction little by little. Yeah, I think all of you guys really hit hit the nail on the head on this one. Um, if, if they're my perspective, I think one, the time is now and every company is responsible. You know, there's, there's no walking away from it. Like you said, Lindsay, we have to level the playing field. Everybody has a duty to do, to do the right thing. Um, something that, that I've seen in my time working at TerraCycle and Loop that, that's really encouraging that I think companies need to, to continue to do is sustainability doesn't lie just with the sustainability department. It doesn't lie with the green team of five, you know, uh, very enthusiastic people who are trying to, to kind of bang the drum internally to get people to do the right thing. I think no matter what your job is, no matter what your title is, sustainability is included in that job description, right? We all have a responsibility within these big organizations to think about the planet. Um, so that's that's something that I, I think is is mandatory now. It's it's not optional. It's it's not a side project. It's it's core to what everybody does. 
So, um, kind of um, going, this, this actually addresses some of the questions and building on what we have here. Brian, um, the foundation is, is tasked with collecting materials that were not recycled in, in, in these different types of markets that TerraCycle traditionally works in. Can you tell us just how your team does this and, and who you're partnered with right now? Sure. So I'll start off with Thailand. Uh, in Thailand, we have deployed a fleet of river plastic traps that uh, we designed uh, that are planted in these heavily polluted canals in Bangkok. Uh, and these plastic traps basically capture all sorts of garbage that is floating in these canals in Bangkok. Uh, we basically collect that collected garbage uh, we bring it to our sorting plant on the bank of the canal. Uh, we sort it into a wide number of different waste streams. And then from there, uh, we identify the most sustainable solution for those waste streams. Uh, whether uh, that is a local solution, which is our preference, uh, but there's also possibilities for us to leverage that waste into global supply chains uh, to be used as raw material, for instance, for things like new Procter & Gamble shampoo bottles, to give an example. Um, in India, um, we are, like I mentioned earlier, partnering with existing enterprises that have organized local waste pickers. And uh, once we purchase the, that waste from them, uh, which is, you know, uh, Part of the arrangement is you know, giving those waste pickers a consistent revenue stream where you know, we're, we're taking you know, careful care of their livelihoods in the process. And then from there, very similar to what we're doing in Thailand, we're identifying the most sustainable solution for that waste, uh, leveraging that into a variety of new applications, whether that's playgrounds, whether that's new uh, consumer product, good products, or you know, baseline supply chain products like you know chairs and and uh, frisbees and, and things like that. Um, in order to address the engagement community engagement aspect, uh, we are partnering with other NGOs that are focused on education and uh, engaging with local community members on the consequences of waste and why they should care and why that's in their best interest to to, to care. So uh, we work with a, a wide ecosystem of stakeholders to, you know, one, prevent the waste from getting into the environment, and then two, working with uh, both the collectors and the processors to properly manage that waste. Great. Thanks, Brian. So building on that, I, I think we can't do this alone. Right, we all work for different companies, but unfortunately, we can't act unilaterally and, and expect change. So partnerships are, are really key to, to what we do. Um, so maybe we'll go to Sue and then to Lindsay. Sue, if you can briefly kind of tell us, you know, what are the benefits of, of TerraCycle partners, briefly, and then mm -hmm. we'll, we'll go to Lindsay, and then maybe Lindsay, you can talk about some of the partnerships you've built. Uh, if you want to mention Loop and what we do, I'd be grateful. But but what you do outside of Loop as well, um, I think that would be really wonderful. And just how how everybody's leveraged partnerships in the community um, to to grow our businesses. Hmm. So through TerraCycle, uh, specifically, primarily through our our free recycling programs, but also through our zero waste box uh, unit. We work with a number of large uh, consumer packaging good companies uh, to solve their waste issue. So, and so what, how this works is, so like through the free recycling programs, what we do is we um, oftentimes either we engage the, the, the brand partner directly or the brand partner comes to us and we discuss a, a waste issue that they're having. And then we work with through our R&D department and we come up with a solution for the packaging waste. And then we create a larger uh, recycling program that are surrounding the packaging waste. And we roll that out to the consumer and we allow the consumer to be actively engaged in uh, collecting and uh, returning that packaging waste to us. And again, as I said, we, we have a whole process to um, 
work with it and uh, and uh, we divert it from the landfill and then in turn we have a whole circular type system where we turn it we take the the recycled plastic and then turn it into other goods like whether it be decking or composite wood or ashtrays or frisbees or watering pet cans or or um, composite plastic furniture, that type of thing. So it's a full circular system and it's it's really like a no brainer for the brands and for us. And uh, so to have come up with a, a usable solution to, to combat the uh, plastic waste, waste issue. For us, you know, partnerships are key. I think I mentioned, you know, awareness being the biggest barrier to to meeting this plastic challenge and so for the us that means you know meeting people wherever they are getting in touch with people however we can and that's why loop has been such a great partner for us i mean you guys speak with a a, lou a louder microphone uh than a small company like we could ever do um you know your access to larger brands larger media outlets has been huge in advancing the idea of reuse and a circular economy in a way that, that smaller groups just can't. And so we have been thrilled to, to partner with you guys and offer one more way for people to try and, and engage with reuse. And our other partnerships are the same. We work with some brick and mortar stores because you know some people are never gonna shop online and that's okay too. So you know partnering there, offering brick and mortar where we can, offering re working with refill stations if that's where people are and that's how they wanna engage in reuse. I think that, you know, all of us play the role that we can and, and for everybody that reuse can look a little bit different. So, you know, just trying to make solutions fit for as many people as possible. Thank you, Lindsay. That's so very powerful. I think a lot of times, you know, if there's anything I've learned in sustainability and not to not to jump to my closing comments yet, but there is no silver bullet. Right, and we need to be able to provide consumers with multiple different options um, towards reusability. Um, so I think we're going to to go into some questions. We we have about seven minutes left. So the first one is: Are you exploring partnerships with Amazon or grocery supply chains for scaling up and enabling a true circular economy? Um, great question. I think it's it's probably directed uh, at Loop. Uh, what I would, I'm going to answer this question in, in a little bit of a roundabout way. I would say if you look at our core competencies as a company, one, we're, we're not a brand. It's why Plain Products is such an important partner uh, amongst many others. Is we don't want to make products. We want the companies and brands who are man manufacturing their products to continue to do so. So if we look at us internally, what, what Loop is, is we are a cleaner. Right? We want to be able to clean and sanitize packaging so that it can go back to these companies uh, to be refilled. So now getting to the question. What we're also not is we're not a retailer. So at the end of the, the day, our goal is to embed our idea of reuse into as many distribution channels as possible, whether it's Amazon, um, but you know, right now in the US, we're partnered with Kroger and Walgreens, and you're gonna be able to go into Kroger and Walgreens and buy Loop products. Uh, in Canada, it's with Loblaws. In France, it's Carrefour. The UK, it's Tesco. Australia, it's Woolworths. Japan, it's Aeon. Um, and, and while there may be only one or two today, um, we're growing, right? Earlier this week, we announced our partnership with, uh, with Ulta. So the idea is for us to bring reusability to as many retailers as possible. It's not gonna happen overnight, but I can say that that we're definitely making big strides and it's going to help us. It's gonna help our partners and it's gonna help the consumer access these products easier over time. So question number two, um, how are you making sending plastic waste more accessible for communities of color or poor communities? Um, I don't, I'm not sure everybody has the, ca the capacity to mail something in. So thank you, Rita. That's a really great question. And, and one, I'm probably going to turn over to, to Sue and then maybe even Brian as well, because I know in the foundation we're, we're really 
targeting, um, you know, poor communities. So TerraCycle, that's an excellent question. TerraCycle has a huge network of public drop-off locations. Um, so there's no mailing required. Uh, so it, these can be easily found on our website. A uh, number of the programs have uh, interactive maps where you can put in your zip code and you can find all the public drop-off locations that are near you. And, uh, it, and it specifies the waste streams that they're collecting for. Oftentimes these are churches or uh, community organizations or municipal organizations. It could be pretty much everybody. It could be local businesses. It, it just truly runs the, it runs the gamut. So basically just as simple as putting in your zip code and you could find these locations and all you have to do is come in and drop it off. And uh, we're actually in the process of ramping this up and, and having um, a number of our uh, recycling programs participate in this and likewise uh, through Subaru and through um, uh, through Subaru that if you can there they are collecting for a number of different waste streams also you can just take your waste to a local Subaru dealer and you can drop it off there they collect for chip bags and coffee capsules um, and uh, some other things and they're currently looking to uh, expand this so uh, you know there are a number of locations that you can go simply to visit the TerraCycle website look at the, the recycling programs and I'm sure you could be able to find a, uh, a program that suits your needs uh, with a public drop-off location. Yeah and, and just from a foundation standpoint uh, in addition to working with NGOs on education um, in these very poor communities, uh, we are also partnering with governments to basically set up the appropriate infrastructure uh, for these community members to register their, their trash as opposed to registering it into the canals. Uh, so we've identified hotspots that enable uh, access uh, to uh, infrastructure that that simply didn't exist before. Great, thanks, guys. Uh, thank you for for those. Oh, we have time for one more question. Um, are there educational programs in Thailand and other countries to teach people about plastic waste? Thank you, Jimmy. It's a great question. Um, anybody who wants to jump in um, with the very succinct answer. Yeah, so uh, we're working with a variety of organizations that are driving really creative, engaging uh, programs for both children um, and uh, you know older community members uh, around again the consequences of plastic waste, you know why it's bad for the environment, why it's bad for you know people uh, living there, and and yeah, um, you know we're working with uh, a, a number of such organizations in both Thailand and India on that topic. Um, yeah, and we are also, you know, there are other great nonprofits, Repurpose, Break Free from Plastic, that are all doing things around the world and really gathering steam. I mean, I think there were two sisters um, in Bali that got plastic bags banned on their own. They were teenagers and they got the whole country to ban it. So there are some exciting things happening around the world and in, in some ways, the U.S. is a little bit behind the game. And through TerraCycle, we have a number of our programs that offer actual uh, free lesson plans that teachers can download and incorporate into their lesson plans regarding uh, sustainability and recycling and, and how to engage the students. Uh, last year, we actually worked with, uh, uh, through our Zero Waste Box unit, a, uh, a campaign where they, the teachers could get a lesson plan, a zero waste box to collect snack and candy wrappers, and then incorporate the lesson into their lesson plan around Halloween and have the children recycle their snack and candy wrappers from their trick-or-treating. And so it shows, it teaches them from the very beginning of uh, a circular system. Wonderful. So apparently I have 30 seconds. Thank you everybody for joining. I think um, it's amazing to see where we are today. Uh, like like Jimmy said, we need a paradigm shift. I think people want to change more than ever. The fact that we have millions of people around the world um, actively participating in Plastic Free July is so impressive. Um, and there are many ways to do that. 
I think sustainability doesn't have one answer or one silver bullet that's going to get us out of this problem. Um, and, and we all have a role to play. And, and the last thing that I wanted to say is, um, as consumers, we have a ton of power. And every time we purchase a product, what we as consumers are inadvertently doing is we are giving a strong message to the person manufacturing that product that that's what we want as consumers. So every time you buy a plain product, you're, you're saying and you're giving the message to everybody making shampoo that this is what we want. And if we continue to do that as a society, change will come much quicker than, than uh, it is today. So thank you to our panelists. Thank you to everybody joining. This is wonderful. Um, plastic Free July doesn't have to be a month. You know, I think for everybody on this call, Plastic Free July is every month. So let's spread that word. Enjoy your Friday and your weekend, everybody. Thank, thank you so you. much.